all the distance finding off. Does anybody know where the distance formula comes from? Is it the square, is it under a square root? Yeah, it is under a square root. Is it y two minus y one squared plus x two minus x one squared? Yeah, it doesn't matter the order. Can I give you the traditional form? Yeah. That's very good. Do you know what these things mean? Oh, this is the average of the points. Well, no, it comes from this thing. When I draw that, what do you think of? Triangle. What? Okay. Yep. <laughs> Which is a lot better than somebody gave me an answer and said circle. And I hate to tell you, this was a calculus student, so it was really a sad moment in my life. But I've had a couple of them in calculus, and it's been really sad. <laughs> yeah. So remember how I said. Uh, Right minus left gives you distance. We had that talk on Friday. Do you remember that? Yeah. So if this point right here is uh, x2, y1, and this is x1, y1, and this was x2, y2. So here's my distance, right? That's what I'm trying to figure out, the distance between this point and this point. Well, this distance right here would be x2 minus x1. And this would be y2 minus y1. And so if you square the x distance and square the y distance and take the square root of it, you get that diagonal, correct? Is that kind of thing? So, um, I was just, if I know the Pythagorean theorem, I know a lot of math. And that's what I did. So, uh, the only time you can figure out arc length is if you have a smooth curve like this. And that's basically saying from whatever point to whatever point, every point's differentiable. You can take the derivative. There are no sharp points that's going to cause you problems. Okay? And what happens is uh, we partition this up into a bunch of little points. So like I would say, hey, this is x0, this is x1, uh, this is x2, this is x3, this is x4, this is x5. And I compute the distances between all those. Eventually, you get over here to x sub n. And there may have been some more distances. And you make those distances between those smaller and smaller and smaller, and add more and more points, and pretty soon you get the total distance. Is that kind of making sense to everybody? So like there would be a little right triangle right here. So you would figure out the distance between those two. And right here, there's a little right triangle. You would figure out the distance between those two. And right here, there's a little right triangle. You would figure out the distance between those. Is that kind of making sense to everybody? All right, before I go any further, on the back side is the proof. Do you need to know the proof? No, but I kind of want to explain it. All right? So I'm going to make this a tad bigger. And so what's happening here, this right here is the distance formula. So like if this was a 2, this would be a 1. If this was x sub 3, this would be x sub 2. If this was x sub 4, this would be x sub 3. And the same thing with the y's. Is that kind of making sense to everybody? Okay. And so you're adding up all those distances, and that will approximate the length. Are we okay? All right, then the next thing we do, well, we can write it as all those distances are what we call the change in x. And i just means, hey, this is the first change in x, this is the second change in x, this is the third, this is the fourth. So the fourth change in x would be the difference between x of 4 and x of 3. The 
fifth change of x would be between x of 5 and x of 4. And likewise with the y. So are we okay with that? And then what I can do is I can come in here and multiply. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this by I'm going to multiply this. Here's a 1 here. And I'm going to call it delta x of i squared over delta x of i squared. So that's what's happening. And the, oops, sorry. I made it too big. So that's what's happening there. And then what I can do is, because that's over 1, this will, both of these will be squared. I can combine these two and say, hey, I've got delta x sub i squared over delta x sub i squared. Well, that's really delta x sub i over delta x sub i, that fraction squared. And then I just took this one, pulled it out right here. That making sense? All right. Now, Step five, what I'm doing is I'm putting brackets around this, and I'm factoring out the de delta x sub i squared, so it looks like this. And then I can break it up. I'm gonna write uh, summation i equals one to n. I'm gonna break it up as two square roots. 1 plus delta, uh, delta sub i over delta x sub i squared, and I'm going to have the square root of delta x sub i squared. And that's how I get this right here. Still doing okay? And then the number, the approximation proves as we take the limit or take the number of segments to infinity. So if you take a look at um, uh, everything that we've done in calculus, it's dependent upon a limit. So we define a derivative as a limit, as, a, as an infinite Right, we're making delta x go smaller and smaller and smaller and taking those secant lines and saying, hey, as you do, make delta x smaller, we're appro approximating a tangent line. And then the same thing, when we figure out the area of a curve, we take the number of rectangles and move them towards infinity. We're taking the limit there. Well, we're going to be taking the number of segments that we're measuring going to infinity. So we're going to have an infinite number of points on that line. Well, because it's a smooth curve, the derivative exists for every x in the interval. And the mean value theorem says even so all those points that are really close together, they are secant lines. Well, there's got to be a tangent line, a value that has the same slope in between them, correct? That's, that's what the mean value theorem says. So it means that this right here, I can replace with the derivative of f at a particular c, or as c moves along that interval. So what we redo is redo our limit and say, all right, the length is the limit of the summation of the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared. And this right here, a summation, that's what you're doing when you're integrating. You're adding up an infinite number of lengths. And so this is the formula you're going to need. And you're going to see this formula in parametric equations and in polar equations to figure out lengths of curves. Okay, you can see variations of this. Everybody okay? So all we have to do is find the derivative of f, square it, add one to it, 
take the square root of it and then integrate it from A to B. So let's take a look at, uh, first of all, I'm going to write this down. So we have this graph. We want to know what the length of it is from 1 to 4. And so what we're going to do is have to take its derivative. And Matt, will you tell me what the derivative is? Exponent becomes what? Um, one over two. One over two, and it's times two uh, x. You said. Yeah. Okay, so I could say that this is when I simplify it, I can say that I have x over four times the square root of x squared plus eight. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Now. Inside of here, I have to square that. Would you agree? So I'm going to figure out what that is squared. Or somebody in here is going to figure that out. What do you get, um, Alexis, when you square this? I get x squared over 16. Oh, yeah. Right, because you have 4 times 4 and x times x. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what do you get here? Plus. Parentheses, right? Because this, this is a time sign, right? Right there. <coughs> so when you square that square root, what happens? It goes away. And you're just left with what? Do you know what we call x squared plus 8 in mathematics? Erratic hand. This is a radical, and we get a radical. hand. Okay. okay, so now what do we have? We have an integral from 1 to 4 of the square root of 1 plus x squared over 16 times x squared plus 8. Lucy, would you distribute this for me? 1 plus what? Can I do this? Okay, x to the 4. Can I put everything over 16? I suppose. Okay. And then, right, because they'll both have a common denominator. You're going to see why in a second. Okay. Uh, what will I get here for this term? 8x squared. Perfect. So I can do this. plus x to the 4 plus 8x squared over 16. Risha, are you okay with that? Are you okay with this, Risha? Do I have 1 fourth here? 1 to 4, and what I have left in here is x to the 4 plus 8x squared plus 16. Yeah, our copier has not been fixed yet. That's a 16 that looks like a 10. Does everybody see where the 1 fourth came from? 
Okay, so I could put this over 16, right? I could, I, this is what I'm doing. This is what I would do in my brain. Would you agree with that, that I can factor out a 1 16th? Yeah. And then I can separate, separate them as two square roots and the square root of 1 16th is oh, one I fourth. Yeah. I got it, okay. All right, now, Ethan, do you have any idea what my next step is? Um, take the antiderivative. Oh, not yet. Not yet, I don't wanna take the antiderivative. I don't, oh my God, I don't even have a, I would need 4x cubed plus 16x out here. I, there, I don't have that. Do you know what this is right here? Oh. Um, x squared plus 4. Yeah, it's this. x squared plus 4 squared. squared. Am I happy about that? I'm going to go this way, and I got one fourth. I got the integral from one to four, and the square root of the quantity x squared plus four squared is what? X squared plus four. Do you like taking the antiderivative of this thing? Yeah. Yeah, so do I. So what is the antiderivative of x squared, Ethan? Um, one third x to the third. So I got one twelfth x to the third, are you okay with that? Yeah. What's the antiderivative of four? Four x. So that's just x, right? If I multiply that by a fourth? Yeah. And I'm gonna go from one to four. You don't happen to know what four cubed is, do you? 64. I am so proud of you at this moment. Do you swim? No. You know how I know that? I told you this. I do math, I do arithmetic while I swim. Um, so I learned all my cubics up to a certain point. So I get 64 over 12 plus four minus 1 12th plus one. Would you agree with that? Yeah. So do you see, let's see, what do I got here? 64 over 12, can you see that okay? 64 over 12 minus 1 12th plus 4 minus 1. So I distributed the minuses down here. So I get 63 over 12 plus 3. 63 over 12, I can divide everything by 3 and I get 21 over 4. Is that right? Plus three. Four goes into 21, how many times five? I think I get eight and a fourth. Matt, you're not checking me today? No. 21 divided by four plus three. Eight and a fourth. Okay, now, back side, number two, this is the last one. He says, often the problem will only ask you to set up the integral. That's true. So you know how sometimes they say, just set up the integral, do not solve. And you just gotta set up the integral. Uh, but we're gonna take this a little bit further and use our calculator. So, What's the first thing I need to find, Brant? I am told, set an integral that represents the sine curve for zero to pi. So here's what it looks like. Here's zero, here's pi over two, here's pi, correct? Yeah. So I'm figuring out the length of that curve. What's the first, first thing I need to know? Derivative of y. Right, so you're gonna write this down because I'm sure you know that the sine, derivative of the sine is what? Cosine. So your integral is going to be from what to what? Zero to pi. Perfect. Then it's always square root, correct?
correct? Yes. Dx, correct? Yes. You're adding something in there, right? One plus the uh, cosine of x. Joe, well, what am I going to do to the cosine of x? Square. Square. Okay, it is not one plus cosine. Only a Buddhist would say that. So, put it in that machine and tell me what you get. Did it start out with a three? Was the next digit an eight, which is two cubed? And then two, which I don't get too excited about. But followed by a zero if you wanted to put it there. Is that what you got?